Hello. Hello, is this Jim? Yes. Jim, this is Dustin Wilmus from KMSU Radio in Minnesota. How you doing? Well, I'm doing good. How are you? I am excellent. Is this a good time to ask you a few questions? Sure, Dustin. Go ahead. All right. Well, first of all, I'll introduce you to my co-host, Tun. Hey there. How are you doing? Uh, can you say that name again? Tun, like 2,000 pounds. All right. Tun, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Glad to have you on the line here. If you're ready to go, we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Well, as everyone listening probably knows, you have directed more films than pretty much anyone on the planet. So, so what? Uh, I don't know about that. But, uh, <laughs> so, what, I think Fred Fred Olin Ray will give you a little uh, trouble on that. But right. That's why. <laughs> well, I guess uh, just to get us started here, what made you want to become a filmmaker? How did you get into it? I wanted to make tons of money, meet hot chicks, and do very little work. <laughs> wow. The American dream. Exactly. That's why we got into radio. Uh, p- perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we know early on you wound up working with Roger Corman. Can you kind of tell us how that wound up and how your relationship was with him? Oh, my God. Well, it's it started in 1981, I believe, and... Um, I was uh, on a plane back from um, Atlanta where I worked on a Fox television show, and they uh, they fired me because they were were out, you know, looking near cancellation. And they said, "Well, this guy's got to go. This guy." And they and but the producer liked me. He put me on a first class plane back to L.A. And while I was on that in that plane, I met somebody, and I told them, "Well, I just got canned from a TV show." And they said, well, you know, I know a guy named Roger Corman. And I knew, of course, who he was. And I said, it would be great if you could set me up with a meeting. And I met him. And he hired me that day. It was very fortuitous because his advertising manager had um, jumped ship about a week before. And he needed someone to do advertising. And he hired me. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, pretty wild. So... Um, Anyway, um, that's how it started. So was that kind of how what led you to the B-movies, or were you always kind of interested in that before meeting him? I was always interested in B-movies, and I knew exactly who he was. One of some of my favorite films were Attack of the Crab Monsters and Not of This, Not of this Earth and a number of other pictures. So I knew exactly who he was. So then you were interested from uh, the start in B-movies rather than more than... I was interested from the... when I was seven years old. Okay. And first started watching movies on television. Well, we got to say, we grew up during the 80s, so we were big fans of uh, your early films, especially Chopping Mall. I think that was the first one that I had seen. Can you Chopping kinda... Mall, Death Stalker 2, Big Bed Mama 2, Not yeah. of This Earth, Lost Empire, lots of them from back then. Can you tell us a bit about uh, Chopping Mall in particular, your memories of that film? Well, um,. I don't know. I, I really don't. Oh, well, I guess I can say uh, it was a uh, a movie that I wanted to direct, and I was working for uh, uh, at Rogers, and I had, had done a few, a lot of trailer work for him. And uh, his wife Julie Corman came to me and said, "You know, we want to do a movie about uh, a killer in a mall." And uh, my buddy Steve Mitchell and I came up with the idea of doing uh, robots in a mall. And that's how it all began. And uh, uh, everybody seemed to like it. And I hired a guy named Robert Short to create the robots. And we shot at the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which is now long gone, which is where they shot Commando and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And uh, it came out very well, I thought. You know, it was a, it was a tough movie to make because we had to shoot at night um, for like three weeks because we had to wait till the mall closed. But it was fun kind of owning the mall between, uh, you know, 10 p.m. at night and 8 in the morning. Some other films we wanted to mention, um, Sorority House Massacre 2 and the Hard to Die film. We're big fans of yes, those. Orville Ketchum. Yeah. We actually had Peter Spellos on our show a year or two ago. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Um, when I was, Sorority House Massacre 2 was actually originally called Nighty Nightmare. <laughs> and Roger Corman was going out of town, and his wife Julie was, who's good, really good friends with me, said, 
why don't you do a movie on the, on the sets at the studio? While we're gone, I'll finance it. But don't tell Roger. <laughs> okay, so I wrote that script in three days, using knowing that I had sets from uh, Rock and Roll High School Forever, and another, there was, I think there was another called Slumber Party Massacre, Slumber, Slumber Party Massacre 3 had shot there. Okay. But all the sets were vacated with furniture. All the, all the props and, and uh, decorations had been sent home. So I had to come up with an idea, uh, come up with a reason why there was no, no furniture there. And so that's what we did. We uh, came up with the idea that there was a, a house that uh, they were moving into that where the furniture was coming the next day. So we used all these different sets that were still up from those two pictures. And uh, when, I, when I created the character of Orville Ketchum, I said, I don't know who's going to play this guy, but when Peter Spellis was the first guy I saw, he came in to, a, a, a scre- uh, to an audition. I said, that's the guy. <laughs> I don't have to go any further. <laughs> this is the guy. I mean, he, was a, he was fresh in from New York, and... I hired him right away, and we got along perfectly. I mean, we became very good friends, and I I worked with him a number of times after that. But uh, when Roger came back from vacation, someone slipped up and said, you know, so, said something about the movie, and he said, "What movie?" So he calls me at home, and he says, "Jim, uh, what happened? What's going on?" And I said, and I didn't know what to say. I said, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I made a movie while you were gone last week." <laughs> And he said, in how many days? I said, seven. <laughs> I said, that's how long you were gone. And uh, he said, well, can I see it? I said, ask your wife. She financed <laughs> <laughs> So he says, come down, come down to the studio right away. And I said, okay. We, I went down there, and they were both there. And um, Nina Gilberti, who's now cutting Criminal Minds, was cutting it. And... He showed it to she. Showed, we both showed it to Roger and Julie, and uh, Roger was so impressed. He said, "I would like you to do this again for me." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how hard to die became real. He wow. just said, "Shoot the movie again." <laughs> so that's what I did. Yeah, that's like uh, extreme guerrilla filmmaking to shoot a feature-length film and somebody's on vacation. That's true, but that's what happened. <laughs> So now we've noticed there's a common theme, um, lots of breasts in your films, and uh, in fact, well, th- what's wrong with that, Todd? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> not saying anything's wrong with it. You're not gay, are you? No, absolutely not. What I'm okay. wondering is, like, was that there from the beginning? Like the B movies you remember loving? It seems like maybe you didn't see it so much, but in the '80s, I mean, you could almost even have taken part in in. Like, the breasts seem to be a big part of the B-movie genre now. What are your thoughts on that? Well, they're always good. They've been around forever. I mean, you can go back to the Fay Ray and, and uh, in King Kong, Fallen in the Water. You can go back to, you know, Tarzan and Jane from uh, Tarzan and His Mate. You can go back to, the, to uh, Flash Gordon and look at uh, Gene Rogers. All those were hot babes, and they put them in the hottest outfits. And I saw those growing up, and I said, you know, I want a part of that. <laughs> and, you know, I've always been a fan of uh, brunettes and blondes and redheads. So uh, <laughs> I try to put a mixture of them in my movies. And, uh, you know, when I first came out to L.A., I was uh, going out with a Russ Meyer babe for two years. So I've, uh, I gravitate toward that. It's <laughs> just part of the package. Is, is there any- Can't help it. Is there any can't help it? <laughs> is there any breasts that you have uh I guess like to work with more than others? <laughs> let's let's put it that oh, way. Oh no, no. I, I always it's always I don't want to mention any names, but if you look at my um my uh filmography on the IMDb, you'll see certain names crop up over and over and over again and those are the girls that uh were were beautiful, stacked and could do dialogue. That's that's the key. If you can find a beautiful girl, stacked, who can remember and act well, remember lines and act well, that is the perfect trio of things <laughs> to look for. All right. Words to live by there. 
So on the other side of that, is is it difficult, you know, when you have films that obviously probably have a tight schedule, tight budget to work with? I don't want to stereotype, but some of these big-breasted women, are, do you often find that they can do all three of those? Well, or? I, I, if, if they can't do lines, I know before I go into it, okay? All right. So I don't hire them to say, you know, soliloquies and, and Shakespeare. I'll hire them to say... Uh, you want sugar in your coffee? <laughs> now, that way, I know they're going to be they're going to do okay. But if but if but if I know they can act, I, I'll give them you know reams of dialogue. All right. But you have to you have to cast according to ability. Sure. Yeah. Well, obviously, you've done many films. I mean, several a year for quite a while. Is there one that you can put your finger on that we'd say was your favorite or the one you're most proud of? My next one. My your next, next one. one. There That's you go. always my answer. Okay, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of them I love, and there's a bunch of them I hate because of what happened during the shoot. Or, you know, sometimes things went bad. You always go in with the with the highest of expectations, and then later on, you see the film and say, "Oh my God, what happened?" And then you try to like salvage what's there. So, um, you know, I have some favorites, and I have some ones I'd love to forget, but. You know, in all in all, I think, you know, I, I've counted up my list of films since 1981 that I've written, directed, or produced, and it, it came to over 170 movies. Wow. And that's not even including the ones I kind of went in and fixed that, that other people started and I finished. So just of the ones with, you know, the ones that I know I started from the beginning to the end, there's 170, it's probably 20 more beyond that, which I went in and fixed sure so there's a lot of it's a lot of the huge body of work yeah. and of course there's going to be a, a, a couple of duds in there but you know there's a lot of them i enjoy there's a lot of them i enjoy and and, and obviously there's been a um uh a big surge of fans for for chopping them all and let's say death stalker 2 or you know whatever that i you know every day i get an email from somebody saying this is my favorite movie and mm-hmm. it's always a different movie so, you know, I try to make them for myself. Um, if if they please me, then I'm hoping they please others. But, in, you know, when it comes right down to it, I'm making these things for me to enjoy. And hopefully others will, too. Probably the best way to go. Now, yeah. as you mentioned earlier, you make films pretty quickly at times. You You really can pump them out. Can you talk to us about um, sort of the challenges that come with that? And, and also, is that something that drives you? Well, you know, I've made movies in, I don't know, anywhere between two days to 25 days. Okay? Uh, the average is around 12 to 14. But, I'm, you know, I do these late-night erotic films like, you know, Cleavage Field and... Uh, House on Hooter Hill and all these other movies. They're done, the, the, the erotic movies that play on Cinemax, like uh, Hills Have Thighs. Those are all yeah. shot in two days. Okay? And they play, they play for 18 months. So there's a, I, I, making a movie is like a chess game. You have to think seven or eight moves ahead so, that you, can ne- so you never stop. Because if you, and, and I've learned how to do that. I, I can start... You know, I still get scared on the first day, and I said, okay, let's start here, boom. And then, and then I, I lose all my fright, and I just say, okay, this, 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 and you keep on going. So you, no one ever has a chance to stop, smell the roses. You know, you, you, when, you're, when you're going like how I go, you're, you're shooting, you know, I don't know, sometimes 50, 60 setups a day. Wow. So obviously you mentioned starting in the early 80s, you've been – through a, a lot of different changes in the industry, can you kind of give us your thoughts on how things have changed, you know, from the 80s and through the kind of the uh, big budget films in the 90s and then back to the Internet era? That's such a boring question, but I'll try to answer it. Um, well, you should be asking me fun questions, but uh, I'll try to answer it. It's, it's the, 80, the 80s were fun because it was, everybody was making money. Uh, that, that fell out around 95 when the video market crashed. And then they, 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 we all, everybody, you know, struck out and tried to find out, find what would be selling in the years to come. And we, every, 
but he jumped on the stock footage movies, and that lasted to about 2001 or 2002. And then the Internet started to creep in, and, you know, Sci-Fi Channel came along. And so now I, I, I kind of split things between the Sci-Fi Channel and foreign and, and domestic late night. So I'm making all kinds of movies. And it, it really hasn't – I don't think the exploitation – market has changed. It's just some of the delivery uh, item, the ways of delivery has changed. Yeah. Has that affected anything? I mean, obviously with the, the ending of like VHS and there like so many rental stores don't exist anymore. Was it easy for you to just transition into like just well, you, the you, network? You have to go, you have to go where the money is right now. The money is in foreign television, domestic television, um, DVDs done. And it's down Netflix, the internet, and it's a, there's a big revolution coming every every year. There's a different kind of revolution, and you have just have to be ready for it. But as long as you have product um, that people want to see, you're going to be all right. So that's what I do. I try to I try to evaluate the market and find out what is going to be next. What where can I where can I sell my product? And, and reach the widest audience. Yeah, probably the only way to stay alive. How's that for a boring answer to a boring question? <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> so talk to us. You said uh, what's coming next. You, you, Your next film is your favorite. <laughs> Can you talk to us about what you have going on now? What's coming up? Well, uh, I'm doing, I'm finishing, I just shot a movie with uh, Dominique Swain and Tracy Lord. It's called The Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre. And uh, that's in, that's being edited right now. Wow! And uh, the next thing up is a thing called Chupacabra Gator. <laughs> All right. You can imagine what that is. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, the title is alone. I think already by. Yeah, Chupacabra Gator. Come on, I want to see that movie. <laughs> exactly. I want to see that one. If it was, if I didn't make it, I'd want to see it tonight. <laughs> Is there a chance for you and uh, Peter Spellos to team up again in the future? We teamed up last summer uh, in a, for a movie that has yet to play called Astro Vixens, in which he played Orville Ketchum. Awesome. But I don't know when or if it will air, because I made it for somebody else, and I don't know what they're doing with it. So with the, um, the way things are set up now with people being able to kind of make their own movies easier and put them out on the Internet, do you think... I mean, obviously there was Roger Corman, and then you kind of picked up the reins there. Do you think there could ever be somebody after you guys are finished that might be considered the next guy that's championing I hope this? Not. I'd like to kill them all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think you know, and you know, I've seen a lot of these what they call backyard productions, where people pick up a you know a high eight and start shooting. You know, it takes a little bit more than action and cut to make a movie. And I, I see so many of these movies that, you know, are, you know, shot in someone's backyard, you know, uh, on weekends. And that's where they, they, they end up on, on DVDs and boxes sitting in the guy's garage because no, no one wants them uh, because they're not making the movies for a specific market. And it takes, you have to look at the market and say, well, what can I make that's going to sell? And that's what I do. Well, we right are now? definitely huge fans ahead. of your movies. Okay. Well, thank you. It's, At least um, I know who those two guys are in Minnesota that are buying my movies. That that's fantastic. That is us. Yeah. <laughs> to know. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. been great having you on. Uh, definitely, you're you're doing a great job. We hope you keep it oh, up. Any... I appreciate the the call today. It was a lot of it was a lot of fun talking with you, and um, uh, I really appreciate the uh, the exposure. And uh, good luck with your show. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks a lot, Jim. All right. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Talk to you later.